Ernie, how are you? We are on Ernie's corner of the block party. Ernie, do you notice I'm elevated a lot more? My yes, it's awesome. Higher. It's awesome. I don't have to stand up like this and look down at the screen to see you. I'm now you're looking. right there. I'm not one of those San Jose, uh, what do you call the low riders, as you yeah, were right. saying. Yeah. That is so funny. Well, yeah. tonight we have, you have a very special Ernie's Corner. You know, each week it's always special, but this one even more so because you have many revelations. Yes, it's been, it's been quite an epiphany uh, over the last, well, I mean, it's, it's really like a seven-year effort that's gone into putting pieces, you know, how we talk. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, Joyce. You got a piece here, you put you put the borders together first, right? The border always comes first. So you got everything kind of like, and then you work in toward the middle. And that's what's happened here. There's a piece on this end of the border, and then there was another piece here and a piece. And pretty soon, you know, after four or five years, we've got the border built, you know, and now we can start looking at the pieces that fit to make over the whole picture. And that's kind of what's happened here. Uh, and again, I, I, we need to sort of jump back to go forward. Um, seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, I had a show, my first museum show with our art. I had 35 pieces in a, a, a museum show at the Forest Lawn Museum, which is a very accredited uh, museum, which is strange because it's built on the top of a graveyard. Uh, Forest Lawn is a very famous graveyard in Glendale. And you go up this windy, you, like circumambulate this, this, all these gravestones and amazing, you know, uh, uh, monuments with angels and people sitting on benches and statues. And you get to the top and there's this really kind of European looking castle. And that is the Forest Lawn Museum. And I had a show there and, um, I met Ivor Levine, who was a writer for LA Beat Magazine, and he was given the assignment to cover this museum show because it was an album cover art museum show. It wasn't a photography, you know, a rock and roll photography show. There's millions of those. Album cover art is a whole different scenario. When a photographer shoots an act or an individual, they shoot four or five roles. That's, you know, 60, 70, 80 pieces of film images. When we do a piece of art, there's one. OK, and that's that's what makes it more special. OK, because there's only one of those. I've got I've got tons of film with we shot Black Sabbath and they're all in their underwear. We get doing the inside <laughs> shot for Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. And there's probably 100 shots. And there's only two pieces of artwork. Well, actually, three, my lettering, the front cover and the back cover. That's it. So you can either get, you know, all this photography or you can look at the original. And that's kind of what Ivor sort of picked up on that right away. We kind of bonded. He, he had the uh, curator of the show introduce us. And I had heard of LA Beat Magazine. It was a very cool, you know, local, you know, the music, it's like Cashbox and Billboard and Record World. It was one of those kind of publications. And, and he was a, 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 an editor there. And um, he wrote this great piece. And we became friends. I mean, we had so much in common. One of the big, biggest things we had in common was Burton Cummings, because Ivor's, you know, Canadian. Burton's Canadian. We kind of all, and we did some stuff together on a on a show that we did every every Tuesday and Saturday night. Anyway, that's another story. But <laughs> it was fun. But, um, so we became good friends, and we decided that, and I had shared with him the idea of doing a book. Okay, I, I really felt that I needed to. To put that in you know, that stake in the ground that we talk about creating stuff that lives on beyond you and 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 you know the mark that you make and educate and I and the book became very prominent and so he decided that he would help me and he would write the book and we would put the book together and over the last four or five years he's interviewed probably I don't know two dozen. Acts, Cheech and Chong, you know, The Doors, you name it, Alice Cooper, Shep Gordon, Bob Ezrin, all these people that we did, Tan Heat, Skip Taylor, all these people that we did covers for. And he did all these interviews and we we're going to put them in the book. So and, and, you know, we talked about, you know, his work for Goldmine magazine. Uh, and this was probably this started about probably a year ago, a year and a half ago, about he became a contributing editor to to Goldmine Magazine, and he would, and the way that works is they pitch ideas to the editor and to the 
you know, the publisher, you know, and whoever idea they like best, they do. Ivor's got one now that's on the Rolling Stones. Uh, and, and, you know, the cover is a picture of Mick Jagger and, and Keith Richards, you know, doing a song. So, and that's probably 99, 100% of their covers are photographs. And, you know, but, you know, he was talking about how he was contributing as a photographer and then as an editor or as a, yeah, contributing editor, writing stories about the cover that he got. Um, and so he, I didn't really know this, but he pitched the idea of doing a story about Pacific Ioneer and me, right? And the work that we had done and stuff. And I didn't, you know, I didn't, I, I knew Goldmine Magazine. I knew it's like the Bible for music fans and collectors. It is the book. And, um, and so, you know, he about, I guess maybe five, five months ago, he said, Hey, you know, I'm going to pitch this idea to the editor and see what happens. And I'm like, Oh man. I, yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. You know, cool. Cause, cause you know, any kind of stuff that can help me basically set the record straight, you know, which I've been trying to do for the last, ever since I got on the internet because of what we talked about recently about how people you know, there's a lot of music disinformation and I, I don't mean to jump around, but it all will come together in the end when we talk about it. But uh, there's a lot of disinformation, just like there is. And I think the Internet, you know, is a big contributor to that. Certainly magazines and newspapers are as well. And, and you know, the news and things like that. But the, and so you don't know what to believe. And and, you know, my whole goal ever since I got on the Internet, which is probably 10 years ago, um, I wanted to start setting the record straight because I, I, you know, learn how to go to Google and I Google an album that I did just to see what they said. And I'd look at all the, in their specific eye and ear. And then I go down and I'd see art director and some guy I never even heard of, you know, creative director, some person I never even heard of. And they were like internet pirates. These people would go to places where they could put their name on something and then maybe brag to their friends or whatever. I don't know. And I actually tried to, to do that to help correct that but there was at no avail i mean there's just people taking credit for stuff they didn't do and so that's when i decided okay i need to really sort of try and do whatever i can to sit this straight so now i've you know submitted this concept to the bible of the music fan and collector in the world and it's forty thousand subscribers I mean, that's amazing. And then they have a, a version that goes on the newsstand, one that goes on the internet, and then one that goes in a slip case. Well, that's a collector's piece. They do 200 of those. And so, you know, I'm hearing all this stuff, right? And the next thing I know, they love the idea. So we start, you know, he, he's not sharing anything with me that he's written. Okay. He not, I, I still to this day have only read a few little snippets. OK, and they're they're really great, not just because of me, but because it's really making it's putting a stake in the ground for what I've been trying to do for the last seven and a half years, eight years. And um, in doing that, you know, it, it really um, it, it, it's almost unbelievable that that all this effort has gone towards something that was like a pipe dream and now it's happened. And so for the last three months, we've been putting together, he he'll write something, but he won't show it to me, but he'll say, Hey, send me a high res of this or send me a high res of that. And, you know, uh, so I'm going to have this in there. I'm going to have that in there. And he's also added a lot of the quotes from the different people that he's interviewed. You know, there's a great quote from Dennis Dunaway, the bass player in Alice Cooper's group that said, you know, there's a lot of uh, controversy out there about, you know, who did our, our album packages. And they were talking mainly about greatest hits and a few others um, and uh, it schools out, mainly schools out. And he said, you know, I was there when Ernie came to us with those sketches and it was not anybody else but him that did this. You know, uh, and and things like that. I mean, Shep Gordon saying that if there was no Ernie Shufflu in Pacific Ioneer, there would be no Alice Cooper. I mean, that's I mean, those kinds Whoa. of things. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, and he's got so many of those. And 
it ended up being a 20 page story. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be, I mean, it, dry, it's, it, it, it uh, hits the newsstands and, and the rest uh, on the uh, 15th of December. So in 14 days, that'll be out there. And, you know, your fans and our fans and our neighbors here on the block are going to be the first ones to hear about it in any kind of detail. Because this is, this is airing a few days before the, the magazine drops. And what you see behind me here is, and I'm going to send you a bigger version of this so you can see it better. But what we have over here on the left is one of the covers. I told you there were three covers that they do. Um, and what they've done, uh, supposedly what Ivor has shared with me, is they're only going to do two covers. Okay, And the covers that they do are usually all photographic. And it's usually one act or one individual. And then uh, it's always photographic. So in this case, and, and their internal art department, which I have to say is very impressive. They have an art department that kicks ass. I mean, they're really good. And I'm always apprehensive about people taking my stuff and doing something with it. And it comes back and it's like, oh, man. I can understand you know? that. Yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, you know, you, you know, you create something and somebody takes it and, and they don't see it the same way you do. You know, and that's why, you know, you're so good at what you do. You love what you do. You love the music. It's in you. You have all this information, all this stuff that's coming out, and you're great because you have this block party platform to air it on, which is awesome. You know, so now I'm getting the same kind of thing here where this cover that you see here is a compilation of, oh, what is there, three, so there, I don't know, what is there, one, two, uh, I can't see two, what is there, four, three, <laughs> 12, 12 covers. Okay. And in the corners, there's the Rolling Stones tongue. There's there the licorice pizza logo. There's, there's the, uh, I think, uh, Grand Funk Railroad. And then uh, Iron Butterfly. That. Iron Butterfly. Iron right. Butterfly. So, those are, so now we have a multitude of images. Instead of just one group, they've got, you know, a representation of more, much more than that. And then the, the background you see is a ghosted version of a bunch of images that we put on our uh, letters of authenticity. And, and I use it a lot on our shipping labels. It's a ghosted back a bunch of images that we have. And so we put that in the background and then what the empty spot on top and the empty stop, spot on the bottom will have text that will be about what's in the issue and stuff like that. And then their masthead, their gold head, gold mine masthead. So this is a first because of a few things, the way it is and the fact that we got to do it. Ivor said, you know, there's probably not going to be a chance. Don't get disappointed because we were talking about how the cover would look and he would, and I don't know whether he did it on purpose or he did it <laughs> not realizing, but he would challenge me. What would you do if you had the ability to do the cover? You know? And so I, I, I probably did, I don't know, maybe 15 different versions with different, and he would say, well, take this cover out, put that one in. And, you know, and so we ended up on this one and then they, the cover that, goes on the newsstand is the cover that you see behind me. Let me get out of the way here. Uh, I see the licorice okay. pizza. And it's the licorice pizza. So again, this one's a first as well, you know, because it's a total graphic cover that they never have done. And underneath it, it says something like, uh, you know, serving up hot album cover graphics and then my name. I mean, wow. it's amazing I when you see your name on the cover of a magazine like this, the prestige that it gives you. And, and they're, they're, the other thing that I have here that's up, up on the top here, over there, is the first spread of a 20 page article. And, you know, it's the, the, the art of Ernie Shufflu. And then there's the type on, that's on the right. On the left, this is how it was set up. Here's how the story was set up. What would the history of rock and roll be without the artwork produced by Ernie Shuffler? I like that. It would be, it would be a drastically different. Let's put it yeah. that way. There would be a, you know, a, a, it would be a hole in there. That's, yeah. that's, that's the way I see yeah. it. And, and the article, the way Ivor has handled this article, it's 20 pages with all kinds of pictures and, and how he loops them all together. And it's because, the, the way he was able to do that is because he's been so involved with the book and me. He was a huge fan of the work that we did. He was a, you know, he, he knew who Pacific Ironeer was 
but he had never met me or Drew or anybody that worked there. You know, this is years later. I mean, we Pacific Iron Ear ended in uh, 1984. Um, so it lasted about 14 years and then everybody kind of went their own separate ways. Um, and I, you know, did a couple of different companies and ended up going, you know, on my, by my, uh, by myself, but I'm going to send you a bigger image of this so that, you know, people can see it because it's really interesting. And again, it's not just because it's about me. It's because it's getting it straight. I've had people a few times. I had a, a guy who was an editor at, Time mag uh, at uh, New York Times, and he reached out to me, and he's you know he was real excited about interviewing me on my version of the Rolling Stones tongue and how that happened. And he we talked for probably two hours. The guy was a huge fan of all the other work. Didn't realize that we had done all that other work, and so that was the deal. He was gonna we were gonna do this interview and stuff. And a couple of days later, he called me back. And he was really distraught. And he said, you know, I, I want to apologize uh, in advance, but we're not going to be able to do that interview. And I'm like, well, what is it something that I said, something that I did? What, what, what is it? He goes, no. Um, and I'm not going to mention the person's name, but they also took credit for it. And they took credit from a much higher level than I was able to because I was the worker and they were the king. I was the, the, the you know, the, the lower part of it. And this guy was at a whole nother level. And so he was the one and his company was the one that took all the credit. And the uh, writer said, you know, if I do your interview, I can't do that, their interview. So, and we've had to sit in because it comes from a higher source. And I, I hated that for a long time. And then when I, I realized, you know, I mean, and, and, and it started with Shep writing the letter to the Academy, the Grammy Academy, you know, for the, the award for, or the nomination for uh, Schools Out and how I was the one that should got the credit, the person that I worked for, but the, the response from the Academy was, well, he was working for this person and this person, it's up to them to decide who gets the credit. Okay. So you're an employee, you have nothing to say about it. And that, that's one of these exciting things that happened when I posted lately about getting this lawsuit, being able to talk about it, because that was a real grind, groundbreaker for me. You know, the artists have very, very little control and very little rights you know, I've had, you've seen the BG's thing got ripped off, the Welcome to My Nightmare. I saw another version of that. Somebody did it for Thanksgiving. And, you know, they, they can just do it. And they call it a parody, and I have no recourse. If I take, you know, five notes from somebody's song, they sue the hell out of me, and they got they win. Yeah. So, you know, doing what I was able to do and coming to this winning, you know, lawsuit, and, I mean, it didn't even go to court. I mean, it ended after two letters from my attorney. Um I found it's out. It's so frustrating, though. Or yeah, it's it is. Very frustrating. It is. It really is. Uh, and even though I love my lawyer and he's the best number one in the state of California for intellectual property rights and licensing, it's still a, a real, uh, it's brain damage and you don't want to go through it. You know, it's just a lot of frustration, a lot of waiting. I mean, it's, it's, it's awful. But, you know, in the end, I was able to win out. And then, um, as I mentioned, you know, I found out from two very reputable sources that, Whoever, after 35 years, the, the rights go back to the creator. So not only do I have the piece and the licensing rights and the merchandise rights, but all the rights now come back. There's no way that a record company can step up and go, hey, on that album that you did, there's a copyright line and we have the copyright to that. Well, no, that album was 50 years ago. And the law says 35 years, so I own the rights. That's it's a beautiful. victory. Yeah, it's that a, is. A, it, yeah. Well, you know, that is a victory. It is. It is. And I mean, I don't know whether a lot of people really understood what I was talking about. And I, I tend to, you know, go off on tantrums. But there's a lot of bad actors out there who oh take God, credit, yeah. not just in politics, you know, in business, any business, any business. Because I worked in major corporations. I worked in top 
five corporations, Nestle, Kraft, Coca-Cola. Those are the biggest companies around and, or at least were until the tech thing came along. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's the same thing there. It's all politics. They won't let you be neutral. You have to be on, you have to be for us or against us, you know, and that's really sad. And, and it, it was like that for me on the internet. When I first got on and I started talking about how I did this and that, people would go, you're a liar. You're a liar. You didn't do that. Well, oh, really? You know, well, you know, you're, how old are you? 28? Okay. And what we're talking about, something that was 45 years ago. And when I was doing it, I didn't see you there. So where are you getting your information? For me, it's coming from the horse's mouth. You know, I did it. I lived it. That's why I'm so excited about this. It's, it's really, it's the truth. Yes. And the truth right. will set you free. It and sure and I, it's taken me a long time, Joyce. It's taken 52 years to get this record straight. But for me, and, and you know, I'm just real excited about this whole thing with, with Goldmine Magazine and Ivor is like beside himself. I mean, he really, I mean, for him, this is a, a big thing too, because he, he created it. It was his idea. He pitched it. All I did, and he always plays his importance down, you know, and I'm, you know, and it's, that's just the kind of guy he is, you know, he's really very talented and, and, uh, you know, and he's been, you know, we've been really good friends for a long time. And, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's really nice to, to win, win people over. And it's, it's been a long battle, you know, and thanks to you, thanks to some of the other articles and stories and podcasts that I've been able to do. Uh, it's helped me every little step of the way. Every time something happens, every time we do a Ernie's Corner yeah. on the block party, there are two or three people or more that weigh in, that I see friends on Facebook. You know, it's just an, it's an awesome thing. And, and you've really given me, you know, you've really given me the ability to, to help Set it straight. And that's all I want. I don't really care about, oh, well, this guy's famous or he did this and that. That doesn't matter. You know, what matters is there was a lot of really great work done at Pacific Eye and Ear and afterwards with other people, not just me. I say that all the time. I never, I can't show you one thing that I did that didn't involve somebody else or a group of people or something that influenced me. People that say, oh, I did it all by myself and, you know, they, nobody else had anything to do with it. And that's, that's, uh, they're that's they're lying true. then. They're lying. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, and, and to win people over like that over the years, even though it's taken a long time, it's very, it's very um, hopeful. It gives, it gives me hope that, you know, things will, that the truth always comes out eventually, no matter how smart you are or how conniving you are, there's always – there's always a laptop that's left at a repair shop, you know, a stupid thing that is the pebble that starts the avalanche, you yeah. know, and it's been that way for me, these pebbles, they've all, you know, and I just posted something last night. I was going off on a tangent about pebbles becoming rocks that become boulders that become the avalanche. And that's kind of what's happened here. It's. We're so yeah. thrilled because of WHFC, you know, Hartford Community College, we're part of the Arts and Humanities Division. Right. So it is just absolutely great to have you doing Ernie's Corner because not only am I learning and the listeners on the block, but we have students that are also learning as well too. And, yeah. and, and, and they're getting it firsthand. Yeah, I've done that. I've done that several times here in the desert. I had a, a teacher actually... I had my truck parked at the supermarket and she left a note on my window saying, would you give me a call? I'm a teacher and I'd like to have you come to my class. Oh, and she right. had a, a class of seniors that were um, getting ready to move on. And so she had me come and I've done this like three or four times over the years, different classes. And I show them the work and I talk about how following your dream is so important. And when you're young, People say, oh, no, forget about that. It's like the, it's like the graduate, plastics, plastics. That's you got to get into plastics, you know. And, and so you're kind of discouraged. If you have a dream that's really kind of different, that seems unachievable, to me, that was always the biggest challenge. I, I know I can do it, you know. I, I just – and I, I fail. And, I, and we talked about this uh, earlier, yeah. Joyce, about examining failure. It's so critical to understand why you failed. You need to do a, 
autopsy on that failure because it's too easy to just forget about it. And you're conditioned to forget about it. Don't think about it. It was a bad thing. Move on. You got to move forward. And it, it's not like that because you just keep on failing. At least I did. I failed a lot. I failed more than I succeeded. But in the end, if you're persistent and you really believe in yourself and what you do, then it comes around. It does come around. It's, it's really about, you know what? It's like planting a seed. You know, some people plant the seed and they maybe forget to water it or it comes up and it doesn't get enough sunlight or weeds kill it. And then there's that gardener that looks at it every day and sees what it needs and, and fulfills that need. And that's really what it comes down to. It, it becomes reaping the benefits of what you've planted. And I, and I feel that myself and Pacific Ironier, but even more Pacific Ironier, because a lot of the stuff that we talk about, a lot of the stuff that people know, is the music stuff. But the music was a little part of it. And that's the other thing that's great about this article. Ivor dips into the corporate stuff, just like you and I do on the corner here. Yeah. And people like it. People like to know that, oh my God, you know, I bought, I just bought Flip's pretzels, you know, with the chocolate on them. And I had no idea that Ernie worked on the packaging. Nestle used to own it. They sold it off. I worked for Nestle for 30 years doing all this stuff that nobody knows. Butterfinger. Like we oh, did the Butterfinger, the finger. <laughs> that was great. That was so yeah. great. Oh, my. Yeah. Like, I was thinking, like, when I bought my Butterfinger about Ernie and Bart Simpson and <laughs> grunge, I, it, yeah. it, it just came to mind. Oh, yeah. I have a suggestion for a song. Okay. Uh, that, uh, I would say Follow That Dream by Elvis. Yeah. yeah. I think that yeah. is apropos. Yeah, I agree. Have anything, uh, any, any other songs, but I no, like No, I mean, that I, dream. I just, uh, you know, uh, Eye of the Tiger. We'll do know? it. We'll I do mean, it because it is. I, I mean, that was always a song that was really motivating, and, you know, you just don't give up. You keep on, you know, I mean, I, I feel, you know, Picasso was one of my favorite painters and, and fine artists and he worked up until the moment he died he you know died with a drawing on the wall like that you know and that's now worth 70 billion dollars you know but <laughs> he worked every day he worked every day of his life and i i feel that this i'm destined for that as well i'm going to work every day but i'm going to work smarter and not harder there's a big difference i used to work really hard but i didn't work smart and that's one of the reasons why i fail so much you know i mean Nobody gets out of this world without failing and without paying dues. That's for That's sure. That's very true. You know, and I also learned to something, you know, in my own journey, failure in many ways is an interpretation. It's mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, what you think is, oh my God, it's terrible. It's a real failure. You sure. know, it's, a, it could be, nah, we just need to do something a little bit different. It's not yeah. a, uh, it, you make the decision, you know, yeah. to, uh, to kill your dream. Yes. And, uh, yes. And it's funny because that you say that because it made me think of uh, this happens to me a lot. Like I'll do I'll get an idea for a, for a, a, a project and I start to work on it. OK, I start putting the sketch together and I get to a point where I go, ah, man, this, ah, this it just it ain't ah, it just isn't working. But getting over and I used to just stop and go and do another one mm -hmm. instead of facing it. Why is it not working? What can I do? And you push forward. And you know what? I'll be damned if some of the best things come that way. That's amazing. You know, it's it perseverance <laughs> and sticking to it and holding on to that insight that you had in the beginning. It's so easy to let it go. It's, it's like lying. Lying becomes like cocaine. It becomes very addictive and it's mm -hmm. very easy to do. If you just get in it and you like it and it makes you feel good. And lying is like that. You feel good. You got out of a situation. The only problem is after a while, you got to remember what lie you told or who you told it to. That's and true. cocaine does the same thing. It takes control, you know, and that's a whole nother story. But, you know, <laughs> I, I haven't I haven't touched that in 42 years. And there was a time I couldn't go 10 minutes without it. You could fill this room with it and I wouldn't touch it. It's a bad, bad thing. And it's very, it's very evil, but that's a whole nother story. We don't need to go there. But uh, 42 years ago, I realized that and my God whole life has been you. different. But, that, but again, amen, amen. It's, it's the hardest sometimes. That's why they call it the hard right. 
at West Point, a very good friend of mine graduated top of his class at West Point. He, he is a sole believer in, you know, always doing the harder right. And I never quite understood that until he explained it to me because it's so easy to not go do the harder right, to walk away from it, to deny it, to lie about it, to not accept it. That's not the harder right. The harder right is to face up to it and, and work it through, you know. And when you get to that point, and I, I did, you know, in my work, in my personal life, the, the best thing that ever happened to me was my wife, Bonnie. She has been my harshest critic. And she's been my biggest supporter. And I'll tell you, starting from the beginning, we talked about that, how she said, she's okay, if you come back yep. from New York, I'm not going to be here. So after six years of being together, are you kidding me? Or where are you going? Had she said, come on home, none of what we're, we wouldn't even be talking today about anything. How weird is that? Bonnie, thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> yeah. I, we owe you, Bonnie. <laughs> yeah, I would have never done any of it, Joyce. It's really funny. It's like, well, if I wouldn't have gone down that street, I wouldn't have got that ticket. A cop was waiting right around the corner and I didn't see him. And I was speeding. And, you know, had I gone straight instead of turning, it would have never happened. But life is kind of like that. And, you know, it's full of twists and turns and, and there's sure good and is. bad. And, you know, they just try to make the best out of it. And that's what I've over the last eight or nine years when I decided, OK, I'm going to do this on my own now. I don't need a partner. I don't. It's been no, actually more like 11 years. And I and I the Internet's been really great for me people want me to do work for them and but you know it's also people that i've been i've got clients that i worked for for 30 years ago they still work with me and i've got new ones and then i'd say a lot i say no to a lot of them too that's the other thing having the ability to say no yeah. you know that's that's what it's brought but anyway yes i agree with those songs joyce thank you again so much you're you i'm so blessed to have met you i'm so blessed to be able to uh, be on the corner lot you know, like I am in every one of our images. I'm I'm in a corner somewhere. And we you know? love having you there, you know, in the corner. But we also, we love having you, you know, right. Yeah. We have you, you get out of the corner too. Yeah. You're, you're well, not it, locked in there, Ernie. You well, know I, again, I, I really appreciate you and, and all our neighbors. They're great, great folks. Great folks. And, it, and I'm telling you, I'm getting more and more views on all these shows. It's amazing. You know, each one of them is up over a couple hundred views. One of them is almost 600, the Turtles. And uh, Mary Travers is doing. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing. And, I, you know, I kind of always tune in to see how it's going. I want to make sure that, you know, we're right there where we need to be. But, you know, and, and I, I feel right at home. And thank you so much. You're very blessed. And, and I'm blessed in, in being able to know you and be able to have such great neighbors. <laughs>